Welcome back. My guest in this segment is Trevor Hancock. Uh, he's a recently retired professor at UVic. And what, were you, what field were you teaching in? Well, I taught in public health, but my understanding of public health, I used to tell my students, is life, the universe, and everything. Everything about us affects our health. And my particular interest is um, in the, what we call the upstream areas of ecological and social uh, justice and change. And so how, our, how um, global ecological changes affect our health, how social injustice affects our health, and what we do about it. Wow, that's a big field. And uh, okay, so looking around town, I see growing homelessness, uh, people who are almost out of control on the streets, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in terms of our public health, how does this kind of poverty, because I'm sure under the surface there's much, much, much more with people who are just hanging on. Yes. What does that mean for us? Well, I think it's, it's two things. I, I've always gone with the notion that uh, you judge a society best by how it treats its most vulnerable people. And we don't do a very good job of that as a society. Um, I'd add to that you also can judge a society by how, it, by how it treats the earth. And we don't do a very good job of that. So we have a lot of challenges. But there's some interesting things happening. The, 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 the session just before this where you had two of the young leaders of the Green New Deal. But uh, also uh, in my column that's coming up uh, on Sunday, I've written about the New Zealand budget. Because in New Zealand, they've just brought down what they call a well-being budget, first that I know of in the world, where their focus is not how do we grow the economy, it's more like how do we grow people? How do we grow human and social development? And so we need to be thinking about that, and, and a lot of my work is about how do you put people's well-being at the center of our decision-making instead of the, the economy's well-being? We've sort of assumed that as long as the economy's doing well, we're doing well. But it's not the case. Uh, if it were, we wouldn't have the levels of poverty and, and misery that we have, and we wouldn't be inflicting the damage that we are on the earth. But we're doing both of those things as a consequence of our fixation on economic policy as opposed to human and social development. Okay, so probably most people, I would think, would agree with, with what you're saying, that we should put uh, human health and well-being at the center of a lot of our decision-making. Yes. But instead, if you look at the decision-making, it's as if those two things aren't even taken into account. So the disaster seems to be that we, the people of Canada, are irrelevant in the decision-making that goes on here. And what can we do about that? Well, I think to a, to a fair extent that's true, that, um, that decisions are made in the interests of, of the corporations and the, 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 the profits and the income. That's why we've seen the, the growth of the 1%, the growth of the power and, and wealth of, the, the, of the, a, a small elite. Uh, interestingly enough, and a lot of my work has been at the local level, so I've helped to create what's become a global movement over the last 30 years, 35 years, called Healthy Cities. And it's about how do you make cities places that support good health for the people who live there. And interestingly enough, when you look at how cities measure progress, they do not measure progress in terms of GDP, which is how national and provincial governments measure progress. Cities don't. They're much more sophisticated, in fact, and they measure progress in terms of quality of life. And if you look at the New Zealand budget that I just referred to, they're actually laying out a set of 12 uh, domains of indicators of what makes human well-being. And the economy is one of them, but it's only one of them. And so cities have done that for a long time, actually. So actually, national and provincial governments need to learn from city governments about what constitutes good government and how to improve human well-being. Well, if I look at our own city government here, I don't see that, which, I mean, I, I, again, I think most people would agree that's what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. But when I look at what actually gets done, I, it seems 
I mean, I watched them go into neighborhood after neighborhood and just toss the neighbors aside and let the developers come in and do whatever it is they want to do, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, there's another area we've got to get fixed up. Well, those are interesting challenges you see on a couple of levels. First of all, I think to, to, on, on a number of the issues we're talking about, the ultimate decision makers are not local government. Their hands are somewhat tied around issues of poverty, for example. They don't set minimum yes. wages or, or exactly social right. assistance levels or, or, or all of that. Um, there are things they can do, though. Uh, if you start to look at, at issues of development, and if you put it in the context of the Green New Deal, I would characterize the Green New Deal. What's interesting about it, uh, and it's come out of, modeled on, of course, the New Deal of Roosevelt in the US in the 1930s. And don't forget that that was about investing. So the Green New Deal is, is, is about how do we invest and what do we invest where. So for example, you take fossil fuels. We've just seen the BC government provide a whole bunch of subsidies to the LNG industry. We've seen the federal government bail out a pipeline company. That's the wrong place to be investing globally the um, World Economic Forum uh, or the OECD, I forget which it was recently, estimates that the subsidies that are provided to the fossil fuel industry globally is six trillion dollars. We have to stop that. that if, imagine that six trillion dollars transferred to supporting a clean energy industry. And not only would you generate a whole lot more jobs that way, you'd have a clean energy system. but. A lot of the answers to our problems are not to deal with them one at a time. So if you go back to that issue of development, what you need to do is think about who needs to be living here. Can your kids afford to live in the same neighborhood you lived in? And if not, why not? How do you bring in a mix of housing? So how do you intensify? How do you uh, create uh, cluster housing? How do you have uh, secondary suites or backyard granny, so-called granny flats, uh, things like that. How do you do that in a way that is compatible and humane? And it's not a matter of building a great big tower block. I think tower blocks are actually rather unhealthy. We'd be much better to have more ground-oriented apartments. Um, and you make them smaller. If you make those units smaller, they're cheaper, makes them affordable. They're also cheaper in terms of energy. You can put in the latest energy conservation. Um, and if you have more people clustered in a community, then you can bring in services, amenities, so they don't need to have a car to get to the yes. things they need but to get to. all of these ideas, you probably could have said 20 years ago. We did. And, and you did. But we went in the exact opposite mm -hmm. direction. So how do, I mean, where, what is the problem that we can't defeat? I mean. I was involved in forestry issues 30 years ago, and all the answers were there then, yes. you know, to, but nobody was interested. The government wasn't interested, the media wasn't interested. Here we are 30 years later, the whole planet is at risk, and the government is still not interested, and the media is still not interested. So to me, that's the roadblock. It's, it's the wrong people control the levers of power, I guess. And, uh, and I agree, uh, but I think what we have to do is not wait for a top-down solution to come and fix it for us. It's going to have to be bottom up, and that's what the Green New Deal is about. That's what the, the group that I coordinate conversations for a One Planet region is about. It's how do we bring people together to think about and talk about some of the, For one thing, we're not even talking about it. That's why we call our group Conversations for a One Planet Region. We're not talking about the complexity and how all these different things fit together and what kind of development we, sh we need in our neighborhoods. I think the problem, it's not scientific, it's not technological. It's what I call heart, gut and spirit stuff. So it's how we think about these things, it's what we value in life. Uh, how do we shift those values? We're talking about um, if you're going to respond to the idea that we have to have massive change to prevent uh, a climate emergency within a decade or two, that means we have to change our entire social norms. Now, we've done it on smaller issues. Take tobacco, for example. You know, we, we, met, we create a massive social change around tobacco fairly quickly. Other examples we've seen are gay marriage, which suddenly, almost overnight, became acceptable in a lot of different places, including some places you wouldn't have expected. So we can see that these big social changes can happen. 
I don't think they happen because someone at the top decides. I think they happen because a grassroots movement and a swell of conversation happens that says, no, we can't go on like this, we need to go this way instead. And that's what we're trying to create, is that sense of also an ethical commitment to future generations. So it's not about what's in it for me. We should be thinking what's in it for our kids, what's in it for our grandkids. How do we make sure they have a good way of life and a, and a, and a healthy world to live in? And I think if we, if we think of things a little bit more in terms of what's good for us, then in the end, you as an individual will benefit more than if you think about I only want what's good for me. Yes. Because if if you don't have the society, no, it doesn't work for anybody. You've got to have uh, a good, decent, compassionate, caring society that takes care of, as you started off by saying, the people at the bottom and the earth. Yes. And then everything else will fall into place. I think we need both. The thing you were talking about, which we have to build it from the bottom up. Yes. But we also need somebody going after the top saying, yes. What's wrong with you politicians? What's wrong with you media? Why have you been ignoring these issues for the last 30 years? And by the way, we know why. <laughs> we know why. Well, I think we're beginning to see some interesting changes there too. So we've seen the Green Party here uh, win a by-election federally. Yes. We've seen them sort of holding the balance of power and using it uh, in the provincial legislature. In, in Prince Edward Island, the Green Party became the f uh, official opposition yes. recently. I think that gets the attention of politicians. We, we, we need those kind of things as well. My friend Fran Baum calls it the nutcracker, as do I. So you need the top down and the bottom up. But I, I'm not going to sit and wait for the top down no. to happen. No. Um, you mentioned, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Is there anything you'd like to sort of cover or we can go through the list of uh, things we were going to talk about? Well, I think the, the key thing which the Green New Deal and those who are advocating for it um, and trying to work to create it understand is that we cannot continue to deal with problems in, in isolation, in silos. And that's actually been part of the problem. So we, we deal with a fossil fuel issue, but we don't think about energy systems as a whole or the way of life and whether we need to change that. And uh, the same with traffic, you know, more traffic will build more roads instead of thinking, well, how could we make it possible for people to not have to make those trips? Can we put telecommute centers out in Western communities, for example? Or can, can we... Can we put trains on the track we've got? Put trains on the <laughs> track. How do we get this crazy. free tra you know, electrified transport system? Uh, it was Einstein who said you can't so solve the problems using the methods that got you there in yeah, the first place. Yeah. And so yeah. we're not going to grow our way out of this. We're going to yeah. have to look at transformational change. And that does mean we need a conversation about values. We need a conversation about what is it we want and value as a society, as community, as people. And how do we include in that not just ourselves, but people around the world? It's no good building a healthy society in Canada and letting the rest of the world go to hell in a handbasket. Um, and how do we do that in a way that ensures that we have a, a sustainable planet for future generations? All the important questions. You know, it would be nice if we had a citizens' assembly here in Victoria looking into those issues and just informing the rest of us. That would be a nice Well, that's nice sort step. of what we're doing with the conversations. Our next conversation is uh, June 20th. We hold them monthly. It's the last one of this season. And we hold them in the public library. Um, and they're 5 to 7 p.m. and they're free and we have a topic each month and we just have a conversation about it. So f this, this June 20th? June 20th. Uh, 5 to 7? 5 to 7. Downtown Library? Yeah, the Downtown Library, okay. Broughton Street Branch, in the community room. Okay, sounds great. Yep. Trevor, thank you very much. You're very welcome. And thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum.